In the previous lesson, we made a, a point about a number of reforms that had taken place under the reign of Alexander II. Now, what we're going to do in this lesson is note the opposition to a number of these reforms. So the reforms specifically we focused on were, for example, reforms in education, reforms to local government, as well as reforms to the judiciary. Now, the result of opposition to the reforms that had taken place under Alexander II led to a series of counter-reforms to essentially draw back some of the major changes that were made during the initial round of reforms that had taken place. So, like I said, previously we looked at the various reforms. Now we're going to look at the response and opposition to these reforms, as well as the response to the opposition, which is, of course, the subsequent counter-reforms that takes place. So we should really begin first by thinking about the opposition to the reforms in the first place. In the 1860s, we start to see an increase in the opposition towards a number of the reforms that were implemented by Alexander II. Now, it should be noted that not all of the reforms that had been implemented by Alexander II merited opposition and led to opposition, but a couple of the key radical and widespread reforms definitely did. So there was a relaxation, for example, on censorship laws, and the relaxation on censorship laws, on the one hand, allowed for the increase in vocal opposition to not just the reforms but just generally to anything that people were aggrieved about. We also note that the education changes led to the growth of more independent radical student organizations. We made a note of that at the end of the last video that with there being a relaxation on the grip that the state had over education even though they still had a, a, quite a significant uh, control over the, the ways in which the education had a very much uh, religious aspect enshrined in it still. We see that the relaxation of education and the reform of education and the fact that more people were going to universities that now became uh, independently organized and independently ran led to the growth of independent radical student organizations. When we think about the reforms in the legal sector, things like reforms attracting a growing middle class, um, we can couple this reform uh, and the fact that the, the result of that reform led to this growing middle class becoming attracted to the legal profession. And then we can couple that with the censorship relaxation that we see at the first point here on the slide. We get the combination of an increasingly critical group of individuals who are increasingly opposing the government policies more generally and they are of and of course they are able to make their criticisms known and make their criticisms heard owing to the fact that we see an increase in censorship or a, a relaxation should i say in censorship legislation so with all of this being said, we start to see the rise of opposition groups. Uh, a number of the more popular of these opposition groups were set up mainly by student organisations. So we see, for example, Young Russia be established in 1862. Now, Young Russia was a student organisation which was hostile both to the Tsar as well as to the Russian Orthodox Church. So essentially uh, attacking two of the most established institutions within the Russian state, that of monarchy, that of religion. The organizations was established in 1863. Now this was a revolutionary movement which again was established by students at the university in Moscow. Again this is something that is often the case when we talk about um, the, the growth of radical ideas. It often takes place through the, 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 the younger generations. Uh, student organizations and student groups begin to create more and more revolutionary uh, radical political ideas and this leads to owing to the fact that there are more students going to university there is a relaxation on censorship and there is a and there are some changes and shifts in the curriculum that is taught leads to more of these radical organizations being founded it was established essentially the organizations which was established in 1863 uh, was established to essentially coordinate uh, revolutionary activities and so we are starting to see a growth of individuals who want to see an overthrow of the monarchy an overthrow of the russian orthodox church and essentially a revolution towards whatever their political ideological um, positions were often we were talking about more communist ideas <laughs> 
So what did Alexander do in response to this? And how do we see a number of impacts that essentially affect him specifically? Well, in terms of the second of these questions, between 1866 and 1867, there were a number of assassinations which sparked a period of reaction. So there were assassination attempts on Alexander and uh, a number of assassinations that were successful as well. Um, this was a period, the reaction to, these, uh, to this opposition was a period sparked uh, by the reactionary ideas in relation to these major reforms. And so what would happen is, in order to try and coordinate and to try and alleviate a lot of the criticisms that were had against Alexander, we would see the appointment of reactionary ministers. So we have people like Tolstoy, we have people like Shuvalov, and we also um, see that these ministers um, suggested that one of the things that was causing all of this radical opposition all of this critique of the government, and as a result of all of these things, the growth in revolutionary ideas, as well as assassinations, they believed that it was the westernization of Russia that was weakening society, the introduction of what are described as more western ideals and western ideas. As a result, Alexander II decided to, instead of instigate and create more reforms he wanted to hold back on a number of reforms and in fact also reverse some of the more radical policies that he had initiated in the early 1860s and this is really where we get into a period of counter reform and we start to see a shift back towards more of the traditional czarist ideas that uh, was argued by the reactionary uh, the the reactionary ministers was uh, going to cause or bring about a, an alleviation of all of this opposition they believed that the cause of the opposition was the westernization the radical reforms that had been taken place by alexander and that to counter-reform, to hold back on some of the major reforms, would be more important. Now, the main counter-reforms that we see uh, takes place in two of the areas that we looked at in the previous lesson. And this is in education as well as in law and order. So if we remember back to the previous lesson, we had a number of different areas where we see reforms taking place under Alexander education being one of the most important and criminal justice and law and order and the judiciary being another one now these were where we see the counter reforms so beginning first with education the authority over primary schools was returned back to the church rather than being in the hands of the local zemsva the zemsva being the local governments if you remember back to the previous lesson that were elected by the nobility we also see the sciences were to be removed from the secondary school curriculum. Again, this was to essentially uh, bring back the old ideas, the old religious Russian Orthodox ideas um, that were instilled in education uh, from the earlier periods. And so returning primary school education back to that of the church or authority over the primary schools back to the church as well as the removal of sciences from the curriculum, was seen as going back away from these Western ideals that we had established in the reform period. University appointments could also now be vetoed by government. Now, this was the aim of this was to essentially uh, provide an oversight over who gets to be part of the university staff, shall we say, within the Russian state's universities. And so the idea here is that the government can then be able to control the 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 implications of or, or the, the 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 creation or the instigation of more of these radical student groups and student organizations speaking of student groups and student organizations they were banned within the university uh, establishment so so groups like young russia and the organization uh, both student reactionary uh, sorry student revolutionary organizations they were banned and they were unable to uh, essentially meet and organize and so they were disbanded when we think about counter reforms in relation to law and order, we start to see a number of different, quite interesting, very illiberal ideas be starting to essentially be implemented. So we see, for example, the work of secret police. They began to increase. Now, the secret police never disappeared within the reforms. We never made a note of the fact that they got rid of the secret police in the reform lesson. But 
there was a, a holding back, a, a reduction, or just a general stagnation of the work that was done by the secret police. Whereas when we get into the counter-reform period, we start to see the work of the secret police beginning to increase. Public courts, so the public transparent courts, were actually scrapped for certain crimes. As well as this, in 1878, we see that political uh, crimes could be tried by military courts in secret. So this idea of transparency in criminal justice uh, that was instigated in the reforms process actually began to be pulled back specifically for certain crimes. So for certain crimes, we see public courts being removed. And then we see, very interestingly, for political crimes specifically, secret military courts were established in 1878, which would try these crimes. In 1879, we start to see the instigation of emergency powers being granted by the Governor General. Again, the Governor General being given emergency powers gave wide deference and wide scope for authority over the, uh, over the state and over the control of society. So given all of these things, what happens in terms of the reaction to these counter-reforms? What about the further opposition that we see taking place in the Russian state? Well, there were a number of events which would continue to perpetuate opposition during this period. So we have, for example, the Russo-Turkish War between 1877 and 1878. We remember back to the previous lesson, we made a note that this war was uh, going on longer than expected, essentially. It was, it was dragging out. And so this was seen as a critique of the modern military imposition of reforms in that particular regard. But we also see a number of external and environmental factors that instigate and perpetuate further opposition. We see a famine taking place in 1879 to 1880, again, where there is economic turmoil or where there is difficulty and struggle to, to feed the population, that population will then begin to uh, become, uh, uh, begin to have more and more unrest. Between this period, we also see further assassination attempts. This prompted Alexander II to establish a commission which was tasked with the job of examining the spread of revolutionary activity. So it was becoming increasingly clear that there was, despite the fact that there was counter-reforms, despite the fact that there was a crackdown specifically within universities on these revolutionary groups and these revolutionary ideas, there was still a continuation of the spread of revolutionary activity. And this would be a theme for the rest of the Romanov dynasty. We will keep coming back to this idea of the, of the spread of revolutionary ideas. And we will do separate lessons specifically on this as we start to go through the reign of Alexander III and then, very importantly, the reign of Nicholas II, where we obviously see the abdication of the Tsar and the revolution actually take place itself. Now, the, re the results of this further opposition were as follows. There was a release of political prisoners as a, as a way to essentially try and alleviate any of the opposition. There was an, ob an abolition, uh, effective abolition of the secret police. It was seen that all of these counter-reforms um, in relation to political prisoners, uh, in relation to the lack of transparency in trying political prisoners in relation to the growth of the work of the secret police, it was seen that all of these counter-reforms were actually also contributing negatively to the increase in the perpetuation of opposition. So this was almost like a counter-counter-reform process. There was a relaxation again back on censorship. So the idea was that people were allowed again to uh, voice opposition and to voice ideas. The idea here being that in doing so, you are... A, you're going to be spreading revolutionary activity to an extent, but B, the express perpetuation of opposition was partly the cause of the fact that they couldn't say anything, the fact that there was censorship. That was the idea that was put in the minds of Alexander. There was a removal of tax on salt, and then this obviously causes, um, this is obviously useful in the sense that in trying to appease the opposition groups, you want to obviously make things as economically effective as humanly possible for them. And so in doing so, we have uh, a removal of taxation on certain items specifically, and what was described as a very clear grievance on the part of those who were opposed to the Tsarist regime was the taxation that was had on salt. So all of these things were um, described and can be described almost like a counter counter reform so we see in the last lesson we see a number of reforms take place 
we see opposition to those reforms uh, or just general opposition spreading across Russia anyway. And then we see counter reforms sort of go back on some of the ideas that we um, had in the previous lesson. And then with the continuation of opposition, we see counter counter reforms against um, those counter reforms that already had existed.